pull the uh, the meeting to order. So this is the uh, public hearing uh, for uh, Tuesday, January 27th at seven o'clock. This is our standards and regulations and single family zones uh, bylaw amendments. Now, uh, just checking in, Mr. Clark, I don't have my normal uh, speech here for, uh, for a public hearing. Uh, I think that's just because this is more or less um, in addition to our regular consultation on this bylaw. Is that correct? Uh, Your Worship, we do have the um, the regular speech regarding uh, holding the public hearing virtually. Uh, uh, yep. Sorry. And, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Clip to, clip to the back. I got it now. Okay. Thank sorry you. about that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. So what's going to happen here is um, uh, at the beginning of uh, a public hearing, uh, we have uh, a, a script that we have to follow to sort of cover up all of the regulatory matters. Uh, a public hearing is a quasi-judicial setting for council, and so I'm going to read through the script to, uh, to uh, go through it first. It'll just take me a couple of minutes time. This public hearing is being convened pursuant to Section 464 of the Local Government Act and Ministerial Order M192. This hearing will be held virtually with all participants, including council, staff, the applicant, signed up speakers, and observers all doing so by electronic means. Public participation in this hearing is being accommodated by speakers having signed up in advance, as stated in the notice of hearing, as well as being streamed live over the internet. In addition, those observing over the internet who did not sign up to speak in advance, uh, but decided to do so once he the hearing was underway, may dial in via telephone to speak. Information on how to do this will be shared over the live stream once we've exhausted the speakers list of first time speakers. The electronic means being employed for this hearing allow for effective two-way audio communication, while those who have signed up in advance will also receive video of the hearing via the Zoom software. As always, written submissions will be received by the municipal clerk on behalf of and shared with the council at any time up to the time the hearing is closed. These may be submitted to input at dnv.org. Therefore, in this matter, all persons who believe that their interest in property is affected by, by, by the proposed bylaws will be afforded a reasonable opportunity to be heard and to present written submissions. The chair has established the following rules for this hearing. One, we will first go through the established speakers list. At the end of the speakers list, the chair may call uh, for any other speakers not on the speakers list. Uh, these are the dial-in speakers, if any. Two, you will have five minutes to address council for a first time. Begin your remarks to council by stating your name and approximate street address. After everyone who wishes to speak has spoken once, speakers will then be allowed one additional five minute opportunity. Any additional presentations will only be allowed at the discretion of the chair. Please do not repeat information from your previous presentations and ensure your comments remain focused on the bylaws under consideration this evening. If you have provided a written submission, there's no need to read it as it will have already been seen by council. You may summarize or briefly reiterate the highlights of your submission, but ensure your comments pertain to the bylaws under consideration at this hearing. Some important notes about public hearings. Council is here to listen to the public, not to debate the merits of the bylaw. Council may ask clarifying questions. The clerk has a binder containing documents and submissions related to the bylaws, which council has received and which you are welcome to review. This is available online at dnv.org forward slash agenda. Everyone at the hearing will be provided an opportunity to speak. If necessary, we will continue the hearing on a second night. At the conclusion of the public input, council may request further information from staff, which may or may not require an extension of the hearing, or council may close the hearing, after which council should not receive further new information from the public. Finally, please note that this hearing is being streamed live over the internet and recorded in accordance with the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Now refer the matter back to the clerk uh, for your introduction. Okay, you're on mute. There we go. Ah, apologies, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'd like to introduce the bylaws of the public hearing this evening, District of North Vancouver rezoning bylaw 1404, bracket bylaw 8472. Uh, the purpose of this bylaw proposes to amend the district zoning bylaw to change how retaining wall heights are measured. And the second bylaw being District of North Vancouver rezoning bylaw 1405, bracket bylaw 8476, 
bylaw 8476 proposes to amend the district zoning bylaw to change how the height of detached accessory buildings, including garages, are measured. Uh, Your Worship, there is a presentation from staff only this evening. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go to Brett Dwyer for an introduction to staff presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Your Worship. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, I can. Great. I'll just uh, share my screen now for the presentation. Okay, so hopefully you can see the first slide, changes to single family residential standards and regulations. Yes, I can. Great. Uh, good evening, Your Worship, members of council, members of the public. Uh, tonight's public hearing is for two bylaws to consider changes to the single family residential standards and regulations. Specifically, tonight's public hearing by and bylaws deal with retaining walls and heights of accessory structures on single family lots. Uh, you may have noticed many of the background documents in the agenda package and the uh, public hearing binder contain information on lighting and noise nuisance. However, those matters are not the subject of the public hearing tonight. So the two bylaws we're considering tonight are bylaw 8472, uh, which amends how retaining walls are regulated in the district zoning bylaw, and bylaw 8476, which amends how the height of accessory structures including garages, is measured in the district zoning bylaw. Uh, in terms of background, uh, through a series of uh, workshops, council expressed uh, concern regarding impacts from single family development and renewal. At the special meeting of council on November 23rd, 2020, council provided direction to proceed to public hearing with two proposed zoning bylaw amendments, which if adopted, uh, would change the way retaining walls and the height of accessory structures and buildings are regulated in the district. Uh, the first zoning bylaw amendment proposes to change uh, the way retaining walls are regulated. Uh, this graphic shows uh, the current uh, zoning bylaw regulation, which shows the first retaining wall is limited to a maximum height of four feet. Uh, any subsequent retaining wall under the current standard must be contained within a height envelope of 45 degrees. Uh, that's the angled line you can see on the, on the presentation uh, from the top of the first retaining wall. And it is noted that there's no height limit on any of the subsequent retaining walls, provided they're contained within the 45 degree height envelope. So the proposal by law 8472 uh, would change the way retaining walls are regulated within the zoning bylaw as follows. The first retaining wall would be limited to a maximum height of three feet rather than four feet in the existing bylaw. Subsequent retaining walls would have to be contained within a height envelope of 35 degrees projected from the top of the first retaining wall. Now that's compared to the 45 degrees in the current bylaw. And under bylaw 8472, subsequent retaining walls would be limited to a maximum height of eight feet. Uh, the second zoning bylaw amendment, which is bylaw 8476, proposes to change the way that the height of accessory buildings, including detached garages, is regulated. Um, so this graphic shows the, the, how the current regulation could work in one scenario. Um, so the, the zoning bylaw currently does not limit the floor height relative to the ground level of accessory buildings. Uh, this can result in elevated structures with relatively high foundation walls, particularly on steeply sloping sites. So the proposal under bylaw 8476 would limit the floor height of accessory buildings, again including detached garages, to be no more than four feet uh, from natural or existing grade by changing the definition of height contained in the zoning bylaw. Uh, at the November 23rd special meeting of council, staff heard that council wanted to hear how these bylaws could work for designers and contractors working in the district. Staff requested input from several designers and contractors and the feedback is summarized as follows. Generally, the bylaws were not supported 
uh, specific to bylaw 8472, the retaining walls, there was concern that it would potentially reduce buildable area for dwellings and also reduce usable yard space. Uh, specific to bylaw 8476, the height of accessory buildings, there was concern raised regarding drainage um, created from forcing buildings, accessory buildings to be lower into the ground. Um, and the last three comments were relative to both bylaws. Uh, there was concern raised regarding additional design considerations and costs. There was concern regarding the ability to comply or compliance challenges on particularly on steeply sloping sites. And there was concern regarding the potential for uh, additional variances um, that may add to uh, processing time, costs, and uncertainty. Uh, how would these bylaws impact existing or proposed new structures? Well, the bylaws are not retroactive. Should the bylaws be adopted by council, any retaining wall or accessory structure legally existing as at the time of adoption would effectively be grandfathered under the non-conforming provisions contained in the Local Government Act. Now, those grandfathering provisions allow these type of structures to be maintained, repairs, repaired, uh, extended or altered, provided there's no further contravention of the new bylaw. Uh, regarding existing permits and approvals, any permit issued under review or submitted before the date of adoption, should council adopt these bylaws, would be subject to review and compliance with the existing regulations. Uh, the new regulations would only apply to applications submitted after the date of bylaw adoption. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Dwyer. Okay, so now moving on to representations from the public. Uh, Council, given that this is a virtual hearing, I will ask that you either uh, speak up with any questions that you have or email them to staff. I believe we circulated an email earlier today. Just reply all to that email to make sure that your questions get through to uh, staff. What we'll, we only have two speakers signed up. And so what I'll do is I'll go through the two speakers and then uh, give a, a first opportunity for anybody wishing to dial in from the live streaming service. And then we'll check in with staff to see if there are any council questions to be reviewed at that time. Uh, so at the request of one of the speakers, I've altered the order here so that the very first speaker tonight is going to be Peter Teven. Uh, Mr. Teven, can you hear me? I can hear you. I assume you can hear me? Uh, very clearly. You have five minutes to address the hearing. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Uh, Council, uh, for the record, Peter Teven, 1900 block Indian River Crescent, uh, North Vancouver District, uh, which is a single family house. Um, I'll start by saying that I feel I don't have much personal interest in this because I completed a house rebuild uh, just about 12 years ago. Um, and, and that kind of leads to me to the first point I wanna bring to you for your consideration. Um, Council, as, as you hear the input from uh, specifically the experts in the industry, I did read that feedback myself, um, one of those two uh, firms, or one of the two that I read, was in fact the architect who designed uh, our house as well. And I consider him very expert and wise in the field. He certainly uh, led us well through the process back when we uh, designed and, and rebuilt our house. And and um, for you yourselves, Council, you know, I ask you to consider um, which of you, if any, has actually gone through the process to design, apply for a building permit, and then go through the build yourself. Um, you know, not bought a house once it's built or not bought a, a you know, renovated house already. Um, because if you haven't gone through that, I think you really need to understand that process. Um, in my case, we submitted drawings that had zero variances in March of 2007. Now, uh, there was a, a civic strike in that time. I think it was about six or seven weeks. But with zero variances, it took from March until October to get a building permit. So our entire project was on hold. We were living in a house infected by black mold and needed to get out. Um, and and uh, there was much urgency on our part that's one of the reasons we avoided variances. Uh, and and uh, 
nevertheless, it took that long um, to, to approve something with no variances. So when you add complexity, um, I, I think that in practical terms, you know, uh, as I think you are aware, Council, I attended most of the meetings leading up to this and listened to all the input and all the discussions um, and, and what the concerns were. And specifically when it comes to retaining walls, I, it seems to me like we are coming up with this new bylaw and regulation and it seems to all be about one house. The, the, the so-called wedge house, which personally I'm not familiar with. And I, I listen to the people who live next door to the wedge house and I, and I certainly empathize and understand their concerns. Um, but to change every single family house design going forward because of one concern, I think is a little bit of overkill. Um, and, and really I think the effect will be, and, and I, I, I really believe this to be true. The effect will be that there's gonna be a lot of cases where retaining malls that don't match this regulation uh, will make sense. And therefore variances will apply, uh, be applied for, um, which just puts, you know, I think, I think what you probably find desirable, it puts control back in your lap, but what it means for the homeowner is delays, 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 and costs, costs, costs. So, um, you know, if you're gonna go ahead and do this, one of the things I ask you to do is to set up a committee that has the authority to approve such variances um, without having to come back to council every time because with the current schedule and the current access to uh, not just council, but all sorts of public services under the COVID protocols, uh, it's going to be a very daunting thing, um, a very daunting thing for someone to go through this. And, and I do agree with the feedback that it is going to reduce usable space. Um, so I'll, I'll move on from that topic. Um, and, and I'm sorry, I didn't start my clock. Am I close to my five minutes? I got about 40 seconds left. but uh... Okay, maybe I'll come back a second time if, you, if I might. Thank okay. you. Arrange for that. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Teven. Uh, next up, I have Corey Cost. Corey, are you able to hear me? As soon as you, uh, I unmute, you should be able to hear me. Uh, very clearly, uh, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, welcome, you have five minutes to address the hearing. Uh, good evening, Your Worship and members of council. I have sent uh, an outline of my uh, presentation to uh, mayor and council earlier, and I hope you uh, got some ideas um, I was kind of um, disappointed to hear uh, by, by staff that we're only considering uh, bylaws 8472 and 8476 tonight. So if I get that clear, there's no point in speaking uh, to the other matters that I sent, sent you, but they might be still useful in, uh, in looking at the staff reports. So, um, Speaking on the uh, first uh, bylaw, 8472, um, I'm not supportive at all of reducing the uh, retaining walls on um, property lines uh, from four feet down to three feet in height, uh, nor in changing uh, the 45 degrees down to 35 degrees in the associated diagrams. And I'm speaking especially about side yards, not so much about rear or front yards. I think there's not too many of those. Um, my rationale for objecting is that many, while of course, uh, that's my observation, uh, there's probably in the hundreds, if not thousands, uh, on the typical topography that uh, a lot has in the district, um, Ex those existing properties will become non-conforming if you choose the three foot height option. Um, I wish the staff had provided to council and the public some idea of how many lots this would apply to and how many would become non-conforming. In any case, as you know, 45 degrees, the, the tangent angle uh, is much easier because it's always one-to-one. 
you know, one step forward, one step up. So it makes it uh, easy for the property owner to know what, what they have and what they are allowed to have. And it's far easier to measure uh, geometry in that situation than the 35 degrees case. Nevertheless, that's not really uh, uh, that objectionable type of uh, objection, uh, but it does uh, make things more uh, difficult. The yard space, <clears throat> um, yeah, as you could see in the uh, staff report, uh, would substantially be reduced for lots on sloping terrain. And I think that's kind of unfair to uh, the uh, maximum use of uh, one's properties. So I ask a council to please retain the existing bylaw as illustrated on page 16 of the council package or uh, the option shown on uh, page uh, 17, section two, uh, leaving the side yard regulations unchanged. Alternatively, simply change the uh, vertical dimensions of three foot to four feet and 35 to 45 degrees in all of the associated uh, diagrams. If this change to three feet is not done, that I suggest uh, more details should be provided in writing uh, to specifically the general public that informs them that despite the new regulations, they can um, repair and maintain the non-conforming walls without permits. In other words, please don't leave, you know, the public in a situation where the bylaw becomes more restrictive, three feet, but they don't know what their rights are. They have non-conforming rights or grandfathering rights. On the second bylaw, basically this bylaw changes the definition of height. Uh, why it's not shown side by side, a comparison with the definition you had before and the definition you want now, I have no idea. It's completely beyond me. It's so simple to do. And at first, it turns out that the new definition is almost the same as before, except it adds the red part that I show on the screen, which says, in, except, in no case shall the floor level of the structure be more than four feet above natural grade at any point. So I think that completes my input um, uh, to council for this evening on these two bylaws. I hope the, the 48476 uh, gets some clarification of what it means in real life to have added this one extra phrase. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cost. Okay, I am now going to ask the clerk to provide the um, call-in information to the streaming service. And perhaps just to buy us some time to make sure that uh, people have an opportunity to see it and make a phone call in. I'm going to uh, call Peter Tieben back up to speak for a second time, if you'd like. Yes, thank you. Um, you there are five minutes to address the hearing. Thank you. I'm going to start my timer this time <laughs> so I know where I am. Um, thank you, Worship. Um, so continuing on, um, one of the things, um, I, I found all of this, this information very, very technical to read. It, it took me some time and I'm not quite sure I fully understand it. I, I'm very thankful that I was able to get through to Mr. Dwyer and have a conversation with him, clarified some of the points. But as I was reading, you know, all of this about the, the, you know, the setback and the 35 degrees and the 45 degrees. I, as a citizen, I got to tell you, it was very hard for me to imagine what it might mean. Uh, but, but this thought did occur to me, and, and this is perhaps something that uh, you could clarify with staff. Um, you know, I, I know a, a significant portion of this council has been specifically interested in what you've called gentle densification and infill. infill. Um, whether that was, uh, you know, separating lots as we did several years ago in Upper Capilano or coach houses, for example. And, and we spent quite a considerable time 
um, you spent quite considerable time. I, I spent time listening uh, to the coach house regulation. Um, so here we're, we have height and retaining wall um, uh, regulations for separate structures. I'm wondering, and I think it would help everyone to make sure that before you close the public meeting that you've asked the question on how do the heights in this regulation match up with the heights of the coach house? Because on the one hand, you wanna see more coach houses. And on the other hand, we're now restricting the height, restricting the floor height. Um, you know, I, hopefully that all has been meshed together and, and works in unison with each other. Uh, but it is a question that came to my mind as I read the, the details. Um, I want to ask you to recall, and I don't know if it's possible to display it, it probably isn't, but um, the diagram Mr. Dwyer showed with um, the maximum floor height of a, of a separated structure, like a parking garage, being above grade at any point. And, and what it shows is something that reminded me very much of the downhill slope properties all through uh, the cove, um, you know, uh, along those roads there where you know the the property slopes away downhill from the road and and i can tell you this when i when i think of the idea that water will run from the road down a driveway and the homeowner has to defend themselves against that i i want to very very uh emphatically counsel against that kind of scenario putting the onus of maintenance on the homeowner to hold back the tide of water coming from the city street that we all know not only is water, but will include sand and mud and other refuse that will stop up the homeowner's drain system. Um, I think that is a nightmare uh, scenario and will, will uh, result in a lot of maintenance problems. And, and foremost, further to that, if you're looking at it, what we're talking about is, is making that move in order to reduce the height of the retaining wall. But in the downhill slope side, the retaining wall is in the homeowner's backyard or front yard. They're the only ones looking at it. So really, what have we improved? Um, the last thing I think I want to draw your attention to is the issue of non-conforming. Non -conforming. Um, and and I, certainly Councilor Murray will, will remember when I appeared before the Council of the Day to talk, talk against the Marine Drive Improvement Plan uh, that declared all car dealerships that's legally non-conforming. Well, I can tell you the net result of that. The car dealership I worked for at the time applied simply for a building permit to change the cosmetic fascia around the entranceway. And due to the legally non-conforming status, that, that was something that all it was was cosmetic. Change the frame around a door. And because it was legally non-conforming, every single build, building permit was denied. And is, is that what we're gonna put in here where we slap a legally non-conforming tag onto a single family residence and anything they wanna do, potentially unrelated to retaining walls, will that too be shot down? Because I can tell you personally, uh, my experience in that was that the legally non-conforming status was too pervasive. It was not specific to the issue. Um, I think with that, my time is up. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. Steven. Checking back in with staff, have we had anyone call into the meeting uh, to join us to speak for a first time? Uh, Your Worship, we have not had any callers join the meeting at this time. Okay. So I will put back out there. Uh, does anyone else wish to speak a first or second time? Uh, address the hearing for a first or second time. Okay. Let's just double check in with staff. Staff, have you had any questions circulated to you from council that you are able to address? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, there are a number of questions here, and I'll, I'll try. Uh, can you hear me and see me first? Oops. 
Hopefully you can hear yep, me. Yep, we can yeah. see and yeah. hear oh, you. Yeah. yeah, we can. Okay, thanks. Uh, just felt a little bit quiet there for a moment. Uh, first question was, does the retaining wall bylaw apply to front, back, and side yards? So the retaining wall bylaw would apply to all setbacks, so all required setbacks. Um, so front setback, rear setback, side setbacks, and in the, in the instance of a, a corner lot, it would also apply to the flanking setback. Uh, I mean, generally speaking, the setbacks for front and rear are 25 feet for the RS1 to 5 zones. It varies in some of the neighborhood zones up to 30 feet and there's, sometimes there's combined setbacks. Side setbacks uh, can vary, minimums are four feet, uh, for wider lots six feet, and sometimes it's also a percentage of the width of the site. Um, as, as is flanking, obviously, uh, sometimes it's a percentage of the width of the site. So yes, it applies to all setbacks. Uh, some series of questions here. Uh, how many properties are affected by the bylaw changes? Well, the bylaw applies to all uh, residential single family zone properties. So it, it, it affects all, it applies to all uh, properties. To what extent is probably um, the, the more of the issue. Uh, you know, on a, on a flat site, these bylaws will have very little change. On a slightly sloping site, compliance will be no issue. So it's, a, it's only really the the steeply sloping sites that are going to, it's going to have some implications. Uh, existing structures, here's the next question. Existing structures uh, would be able to be replaced. How does this work in situations where code regulations around uh, how those structures now need to be built have changed? So um, obviously if, if, if anything's compliant, it can be rebuilt. If it was if, if it was made non-compliant uh, because of uh, this bylaw change, if council chose to adopt it, um, the the non-conforming provisions in the local government act allow it to be repaired, maintained. Um, you know, generally speaking, and we deal with this quite a lot. Um, even with the four feet retaining wall, there are a lot of retaining walls that are higher than that, and we generally allow them uh, to be rebuilt to the same height, same location. Um, um, even though they may not be compliant with the current bylaw, as they are uh, deemed to be uh, non-compliant, uh, legally non-compliant. Uh, how do these regulations interact and conflict with the other regulations applying on any of these lots? Well, that's an excellent question. There is a lot of interplay with all the regulations in the zoning bylaw. We've got everything from Siting regulations, set, you know, setbacks, uh, building depth, building height, eave height, and they, they, they all work together. Um, I mean, what you find is that um, with, with new single family homes, uh, designers tend to build to the, to the bylaw requirements. So um, right now, retaining walls mostly are, are at four feet in height, um, with subsequent retaining walls contained within a 45 degree building envelope. If that was uh, more restrictive, or less restrictive, uh, I think you'd find that the designers would build to, to the maximum. Same, same with, um, generally speaking, setbacks, floor space, uh, site coverage and the like. Uh, how many builders did we consult with? I think we sent out, uh, I consulted with our residential plan reviewers uh, to get our repeat customers, people do this a lot, and probably six or eight of the regular customers we consulted with. Uh, how many unique complaints were received from the public on retaining wall heights and setbacks. Uh, I think we did address that in, in the previous report. Um, uh, the, the number escapes me, but there was certainly certainly a, a couple um, that, that spring to mind. Uh, how many unique complaints regarding accessory buildings? Well, um, there's certainly one that springs to mind. Um, the majority of accessory buildings uh, that aren't parking structures uh, tend to be on grade. So they're, they're, they're typically not elevated because people want good access to them. It's really, it's really uh, parking structures that sometimes um, create an issue because there are limitations on driveway grades. And um, so there's, there's sometimes not a lot of movement that a, a, driveway, a, a garage as an accessory structure can, can move. Sorry, I'm just looking through more questions. Um, can uh, comment on non-conforming. So just um, another good question, and I, I just 
uh, I know Mr. Tevin made an excellent point about uh, the legal non-conforming status of some of the car dealerships on Marine Drive. And now there's a very different set of limitations on legal non-conforming uses. And with the, with the Marine Drive exercise, um, car dealerships were taken out from um, the C9 zone as a permitted use. And subsequently, the Local Government Act precludes any structural change to the building. Those provisions don't, do not apply for um, non-conforming siting um, um, issues. So things that would be created by this bylaw, which would be an overheight retaining wall or an overheight um, uh, accessory structure, those limitations in terms of no structural changes would not apply to those kind of non-conforming non-conformities. I think that's the question. I think there was one to the to the clerk. Um, Uh, yes, thank you, to your worship. Uh, there was a question uh, regarding the process for the bylaw to go back to staff for amendment before proceeding. Um, the, the answer would just be that we're in the legislative process. So council may debate, amend, or provide direction at second and third reading following the conclusion of the public hearing. However, this is just to hear from the public during this process. Thank you. Um, I think uh, I'm just going to go back to Mr. Dwyer for a second. I think the first question, sort of the probative value of the first question was um, not just how many properties are affected by the bylaw. I think that might have been a reference to Dr. Koss' comment about uh, how many uh, properties were likely to become non-conforming by the change to the bylaw. Um, I, I don't know who asked the question, but I think that might have been what they were trying to get at. Do we have a sense for how many uh, uh, how many properties currently would not conform? Uh, through you, Your Worship, um, would be particularly difficult to to answer that. Um, I, I'd suggest that probably um, some on the order of eighty to ninety percent of the new new builds would have a retaining wall that are is over the. Um, of the three foot 35 degree height plane. Um, uh, you know, last year we, we did approximately 50. Historically, we've, we've done more than, more like 100 per year. Um, and I just had a quick look at the number of um, standalone uh, building permits for um, retaining walls. And last year we did 10. And I would suggest all of those 10 retaining wall permits uh, would have been at the four feet and 45 degree um, limit because that, that's typically what people design to. They, they, they want to maximize the, the usable yard space. If they're doing retaining, it's typically to, to landscape and get a yard area. So it um, doesn't answer the question total, totally, but um, um, the majority of retaining wall permits and new construction permits today would, would um, uh, result in some non-compliance with the new bylaw. Thank you. Uh, just checking in, uh, Clerk uh, Jim Gordon, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, Your Worship. I just wanted to quickly address a point uh, Mr. T. Van raised in case it's uh, in the back of any uh, councillors' minds in reference to why couldn't we create a committee to expedite approval of uh, such variances. I just wanted to point out to Council that um, the Local Government Act specifically prohibits the delegation from council um, of an issuance of a development variance permit. Uh, and that's partially because there's a statutory process of notification, a notification radius to be done. So uh, any opportunity for a subcommittee deck to update things is not um, in the books, but uh, just means we can speak to things going more quickly through council. But, but the statutory board of variance could manage uh, variances of this type on a hardship basis, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. And just on that point, um, an applicant has a choice, a uh, board of variance based on hardship or a development variance to council, which is, would just be a, a blanket uh, variance granted on whatever grounds the applicant presents. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Okay, thank uh, you. Councillor Bond, did you have a clarifying question? I did. It's a little bit hard for me to write down because I'm trying to think through it. So hopefully uh, you'll give me um, some uh, discretion on, on this one. If that's okay. 
not in a big rush. Go ahead. <laughs> um, and, and it's to Mr. Dwyer. I'm wondering when we are measuring, um, uh, I guess, the, uh, the, the grade or the height from grade, and, and you mentioned uh, from either existing grade or natural grade, how does that work in a situation where, um, let's say we've got you know, three lots and there's a lot in the middle that's looking to apply for uh, either the accessory building or the retaining wall. Um, and obviously it's on a slope. Um, what happens when uh, the, like the natural slope would be like this, but the property on either side have already altered the slope um, uh, to be either higher and lower? Um, I'm thinking of different ways where a more restrictive uh, retaining wall regulation might uh, impact that, you know, the other person's ability to, uh, to kind of construct um, any type of usable um, structure on their lot. So uh, it is kind of specific, but there, as you said, there's, you know, thousands of properties that this could apply to. So I'm just I'm trying to understand that, and that a little bit more, how that measurement happens when grades have already been um, modified on either side of a particular site. Mr. Dwyer. So um, the, the bylaw defines um, natural grade as the, the, the grade of the property prior to human intervention or when that can't be established, the date of adoption of bylaw I think it's 60 and change, 60, it's, it's, uh, um, which was June 13, 1988. So um, I think we acknowledge it's really hard to establish what the, what the grades were prior to human intervention. So it's typically, it's existing grade. So we require a survey uh, through the building permit process and um, the, the height is measured to the, the, the lesser of natural, which is that, that, that funny definition or finished grade. And so, you know, where you've got a, a cross sloping site, you know, sometimes the retaining wall has to jog down to, um, to comply with the bylaw so that's no more than, than four foot at, at, at its highest point. I'm not sure if that answers your, your question, but that's how it's, it's currently regulated. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dwyer. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Councillor Murray, clarifying question? Um, Mr. Dwyer, how many, um, is it fair to say that we have several or dozens of hundreds of examples of non-conforming given that we've changed bylaws over the decades? And uh, what was a house that was built in 1950 and a house that was built in 2020, they operate under different bylaws. So the house in 1950 would be uh, non-conforming based on uh, bylaws that have changed over the years for how those buildings were constructed? Uh, I think it would be fair to say, I, I probably see on a weekly basis, um, some legal non-conformity with a building permit application, whether that's because it's over the, over the maximum permitted floor space now, whether it's a setback, um, whether it's, it's um, you know, any number of issues, but it, it, it's not uncommon to have legal non-conformities. Uh, and bylaws all change. And just to Mr. Tevens' points, all of the car lot dealerships, um, when the district rezoned Marine Drive, all of those businesses were non-conforming. Uh, that's correct, but they became a non-conforming use, uh, yeah, which, non which has different, um, significantly more restrictive provisions in the Local Government Act than a than a, a legal non-conforming setback or- Because the because the district's initiative on Marine Drive was that we wanted to move the car dealerships out. There was a point to the rezoning. Um, so in the case of the very um, extreme examples, and I, I just, I don't have a way to submit this in order to be able to refer to it when we bring this back for debate, but um, the this house on Skyline, for example, and the Wedge House, um, the height limitation on the accessory structure um, would prevent the example that we all viewed at the Wedge House um, to not exist in the future if, if this bylaw had been in place. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. I, I would note that uh, that was a particularly unusual Egregious, site. Yeah. Well, it was an unusual site, so it resulted in an unusual um, uh, result. 
but that if the if this bylaw were to exist when that accessory structure was being built, it wouldn't have resulted in the impact to the wedge house. Well, that, well, that accessory structure wouldn't comply with the new bylaw. Right. Okay. And um, in regards to um, retaining walls, I just want to clarify. You said that most of the retaining walls that exist today, we would because many of them are probably um, non-conforming, depending on when they were built. Um, uh, we would allow the repair and the, the rebuilding of those, even if they weren't, even if they were non-conforming, we would allow them to be rebuilt. Uh, yeah, we, we routinely um, issue permits to rebuild retaining walls right. um, that are in, in a state of disrepair or, or failure or, un, or, or they're unsafe, um, despite the fact that they may not comply with the current bylaw, provided they are building in the same location and uh, to no greater height. And my last question, on new builds, designers have the ability to conform to a new bylaw and through design, can achieve um, uh, an aesthetic or a use um, uh, based on an architectural design or a layout. Is, th is that fair? That there is a there is an ability to design to the bylaw? Uh, I think there, there will often be, but um, I, I'm, I'm sure there'll be circumstances where um, um, it will not be possible to, com to comply because of grades. But um, that's when the variance would come in, and then because of those grades, the variance in all for all intents and purposes would be granted. Well, it, then it becomes a, a, a subject of council discretion. Um, right. And the, the scenario I'm thinking about is where you've got a steeply sloping site and trying to um, accommodate uh, a garage, because you, you can't just drop that garage straight. You know, if the, if the site slopes away, you, there's limitations in terms of driveway grades. So. Um, that would be the scenario that springs to mind that would present challenges. Right. And in um, my last question, Mayor Little, would be um, in um, the last 20 years, is it the vast majority of variances um, when, we, when we entertain them, the vast majority of variants were approved by council, would you say? I don't know that we could be putting out there that past performances that council has approved them. I think future councils retain the right to decide what to do with them. Uh, I guess, okay, so I would, I'll rephrase the question and say that where the vast majority of variances coming from the planning department to council, um, were the recommendations in favor of supporting the variances? Uh, I think probably the best answer we're going to be able to get on the spot, Councilor Muir, in that is that uh, I think in the time that I've been on council and probably the time you've been on council, that if a staff recommendation is to issue, it tends to be supported by, yes. by the council on these types of matters. Thank you. Um, we are starting to sound more like we're workshopping the, the bylaw rather than, than, than hearing. So council, if clarifying questions only, please. Uh, I've got Councilor Forbes. Thank you, Your Worship. I hope this question falls in where it's supposed to. Um, I just wanted to clarify when I'm reading the report on the, the noise regulations, it seems to apply to the, um, the level of the sound and... We're specifically uh, addressing the two parts of the bylaw. There's other aspects that are not included in tonight's hearing. And so there's only two specific pieces that we're dealing with uh, um, uh, for tonight's meeting. They were part of the public workshop on the standards for uh, single family residences, but there's only two specific bylaws that are uh, up for discussion this evening. Okay. I, I don't, I, I hope that's clear that uh, uh, we're, we're talking about the, um, the retaining walls the um, accessory heights, um, basically bylaw 8472 and 8476 only at this point tonight, even though the workshop that we conducted on single family regulations did include broader discussions about more topic areas, including lighting and sound and other things that were discussed at the same workshop. Okay, 
Councilor Forbes, do you have any further questions on 8472 or 8476? Okay, I'm going to move on to Councilor Kern. Thanks. I just wondered if staff could um, comment any further on the um, concerns that were raised by industry about flooding and water management. Um, specifically, I'm assuming that it's because it's deeper, it's displacing more earth and potentially requires more. Um, I, I, could staff just explain what the difference would be in terms of how that would be mitigated um, and, and the cumulative impacts of things going deeper? Because I have heard from developers about the need to actually raise things out of, um, to make them higher, not lower. Um, so I don't know if staff could please comment on that. Uh, yeah, thank you to your worship. Uh, the, the comment we heard was in relation to, um, uh, it was an image in the presentation where the, uh, the parking structure was pushed into the ground, which forced a, a, a positive slope on the driveway towards the garage entrance. And I mean, this is a scenario that we, we see today um, and it can be dealt with via a, a trench or a cutoff drain to, to, a, to a sump. Uh, Mr. T then spoke to it as well. Um, we, we certainly wouldn't be attracting water from the road because there's a requirement for, to, for the sidewalk to grade, to grade back to the road. So water certainly shouldn't be, be coming down from, from the road. Um, so that, that was a comment we heard from industry. Um, the majority of uh, accessory buildings that, that aren't um, uh, parking structures um, are generally on grade. They're not recessed into the ground, um, nor would this bylaw force them to be recessed into the ground. And um, thank you. And then just a clarifying question about um, the coach house, if, if this would have um, implications for our recently adopted coach house policy. Uh, the, the zoning bylaw amendments made to provide for coach houses, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they are self-contained regulations. So this, this um, regulation relating to accessory structure would not apply to coach houses. Um, the retaining wall um, change would apply to the same lot. Um, it, it, I, I can't see it having a dramatic impact on the ability to build a coach house. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dwyer. Thank you, Councillor Kern. Councillor Bond. Thanks again. I was going to type this, but I figured it's, since we're all talking, it's probably just easier to ask the question. Um, Mr. Dwyer, you said that um, the proposed regulations for the height and the setback of uh, retaining walls can or, or may, obviously, depending on the site, have an impact on other, other um measurements such as the usable yard space, um, I guess, size, uh, height, uh, floor space of a, a potential home. Uh, are you able to quantify uh, any of those impacts uh, uh, with some examples or, or more generally uh, based on, you know, the majority of the width of the types of lots that we have in these steeply sloping areas? I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to understand the the trade-off here, right? Um, and see how these regulations impact the different components uh, on particular sites. Yeah, that, that, that's an excellent question. Um, and through through your worship, um, th there's generally a hierarchy um, of, of the provisions in the zoning bylaw. Typically people will try and, and achieve the, the floor space first. They wanna make sure that they can achieve the floor space. Um, they, they, they like, People like to get get the exemptions um, that are possible. Um, you know, then comply with the setbacks, building depths, and the like. Uh, you know, in in all honesty, um, people will be able to achieve those same goals um, if they can't retain the property at the same rate as the current bylaw. It will mean potentially a reduction in usable space, um, in in level usable space. Um, so it it could be smaller in smaller terraced increments and still comply, but you, but it, it, the, the main change I see occurring as a result of, of these bylaw changes would be less singular um, large level um, uh, usable space. So maybe just a, a follow-up that um, 
that obviously doesn't necessarily impact the maximum um, uh, dimensions for a, a principal dwelling, but it might, um, it would potentially constrain those uh, dimensions based on the retaining wall setbacks and then re re constrain the floor space in, in that, in those scenarios. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Uh, yeah, that, that's a fair comment. Um, I mean, I think there, there, there might be um, some additional design challenges, but, you know, achieving the things that people want to achieve in, in a new home, uh, I, I think they'll be able to achieve those kind of priority things, the, the, the floor space, um, um, you know, comply with, with setbacks and the like. But, but I, I think the, the, the one thing that I'm sure will be a result would be less um, level usable outdoor space on, on sloping sites. Um, you know, on, on, a, on a, a flat or um, gently sloping site, I, I don't think you would see a change as a result of these bylaws from the current bylaws because people aren't building the retaining walls to the maximum height. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Councillor Meary, clarifying question. Um, so just in the example of a, a sloped yard, um, if you were to um, look at some of the lot pattern down in the cove, for instance, on Beachview or Rosland or Baycrest, um, because they all sit on a slope, what's the argument in regards to retaining walls going from the curb all the way up to the top of the hill um, as, as one large mass of cement? Um, versus the previous um, uh, home, the old home that was ripped down where there was um, two full grassed lawns. Um, like the, the, I'm just, I, I just, I'm curious, like I'm just a little bit concerned about the concept that if um, this bylaw were to be supported, that usable space would disappear. But one just has to look at a house that was built in 1957 on a slope. In some areas, not all, because not all lot sizes and lots are the same, obviously. It's not one size fits all. I think that's some of the challenges with our bylaws. Um, but you could look in many of those old houses on Baycrest, Roslyn and Beachview, and those properties that built houses in the 1950s had full front yards. And now with the new houses being built, many of them have front yards filled with massive cement retaining walls and cement bedding blocks, like massive ones that take up the entire front yard. So the idea that the, the suggestion that the usable yard is going to disappear because of this bylaw, I, I just would challenge that. And, and I think there's, I think there's a lot of examples, Mayor Little, and it is unfortunate, Mr. Cross pointed out. Councilor, this isn't the place to make argumentation for or against the bylaw. This is the place to ask clarifying questions of staff on the mayor on on the to help you understand it, so that we can have our. Um, okay, so then I would ask that meeting. staff bring forward um, uh, um, uh, photographs to compare. Um, ex or to give examples of front yards being lost um, because of the reduction in the retaining walls. And again, it's a variance. So it's not like um, property owners or uh, developers can't do it. It just means that council has an ability to give a second glance and make sure the impact is limited to the, the neighboring properties. So I think it, to be fair, we should have had some examples of um, what Mr. Dwyer is talking about because Mr. Dwyer understands the technicalities of this um, yes. very well. The time for that was at the workshop, which we had a very full workshop. We had opportunity for council to ask questions at that time. If, if any member of council is not satisfied that they have enough information to make the decision, they can always vote against the proposal at second and third reading and, 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 and share their reasons why. And their reasons quite legitimately could be that you didn't feel there was enough information at the time. The hearing is not the place for that, uh, that kind of discussion or debate. That's at the workshop, or if you're not satisfied that all of the information has been provided, then to vote against the matter at second and third and return the matter back to the point where we can have more discussion and more information provided uh, for the public. It can't happen during the hearing though. Uh, and so uh, at this point, so council- Can I, I just ask, have my question answered? 
the question was for them to provide information uh, going forward at, uh, at, at, at second, third, third reading. Am I, My uh, question was actually, what is the difference between um, uh, a lot that is reduced in lot area in the front, yard in the front, um, versus the reduction of retaining walls um, under this bylaw? And uh, like, I, I, I'm not sure why there is a reduction of usable space when currently in many lots, the usable space is a cement wall. I think Mr. Dwyer's response to that was that it's a case by case basis if there is going to be a reduction in the potential buildable space and it's based on the constraints of the lot. And if you can't uh, level out enough of the lot, it may affect the buildable space uh, um, on a property just due to the constraints. And, and so- Mr. Dwyer, is that a fair uh, paraphrasing of your comments? Yes, Your Worship. And so if that was a problem, what would the solution be? The variance? The person can apply for a variance. There we uh, go. But also not every lot can have a fully maximized house built on it. There's going to be constraints on every house on every lot already. Like we do right now. Correct. Okay. Council, I see no further hands at this point. So um, we do have uh, a caller that has uh, had joined, but I, I, I don't see them listed anymore. So I'm just going to check in with the, the clerk. Genevieve, uh, do you have, Miss Lance, do you have a, a, a caller for us? Um, Your Worship, we do, the caller has left the meeting. We okay. do have an individual who's joined under the name Mitchell's iPad who was not pre-registered for the meeting. Okay. Uh, for the person at Mitchell's iPad, uh, do you want to be added to the speakers list? Yes, please. That would be great, Your Worship. All right. Is this uh, Mitch Baker? It is. Done. Okay. Uh, well, we've we've already gone through first-time speakers, so you'd be a first-time speaker. So uh, please go ahead. You have five minutes to address uh, the council. Okay. Um, it, it probably won't be that long. I, you know, I can be long-winded, Your Worship. Um, my my feelings on this are that uh, these bylaws that have been put in place. Uh, took more than a decade to put in place to build these uh, zoning bylaws. And for the sake of seemingly a couple of properties, it's been brought to the forefront where this should be changed. Uh, I, I don't think that there's a, a, a large enough um, understanding of the impacts of what these do to people's properties by the council, uh, given the short, short period of time that it's been looked into. I know that even just by looking at the bylaw that it's written, that it was as it was sent to me, uh, it raises some questions even to how it's been written with the retaining wall on the downslope, showing walls coming off the top of a retaining wall with, with no limit running off at 45 degrees. Obviously the, the amount of, um, uh, uh, what do you, what's the right word for it here? Sorry. Um, the attention to detail just in drawing up of the bylaw seems lacking. There, there doesn't seem to be a, uh, a comprehension of what the impact of this will be. I know most of the properties that I build and I, I, I caught in late here um, that have the four foot retaining wall at the property line and back at 45 degrees. Some of them would lose 10 feet of property or it would be sloping away. I did, I did some calculations here uh, to put a three foot wall and then back at 35 degrees and you're losing in a, in a 12 foot rise in that alone, you're losing um, uh, five and a half feet of side yard uh, to get 12 feet in, in areas uh, such as the, the, the house on sunny crest where the wedge house is uh, there's been a manipulated grade to install that house back whenever that wedge house was built which has now impacted the neighbor to the, uh, I guess it would be to the north, where he's now retaining, the original grade was manipulated to such a degree uh, that it's actually three feet below the road level. And the neighbor to his high side of, of the new build, his main floor is about seven feet above the 12 foot retaining wall, the 12, series of 12 foot retaining walls above his main floor, and his main floor is 12 feet plus above the neighbor below in the wedge house, which whose grade has been artificially manipulated lower than it was to natural grade. So when we start, when we start talking about retaining walls 
from natural grade and the natural grade has been manipulated, suddenly this person's right and this person's wrong. It took decades for these bylaws to be put in place and for the sake of a couple of places, it's been brought to the forefront. I think there needs to be a lot more research and a lot more education about by the people that are making these decisions about what the actual impacts are around the neighborhoods. Uh, the lowering of the garage in that house would lower his garage almost six feet, which would basically make it absurd to have that placed on that property. To move it to the other side of the property, it would be a, a too, too steep a driveway to get in at the 20% grade maximum allowable by the municipality. Uh, my concern is that it's, it's too fast. Yes, there's some situations where this is, a, this is problematic. There seems to be more, there's, there's far more situations where it's not problematic than there are ones where it is. And if we, if we, if we fix a paint chip with a three foot roller, we're gonna impact way more people than were set out and by these guidelines. By changing the guidelines so, and it seems like little numbers, three feet and 10 degrees, it makes an enormous impact on some of these properties. And essentially, you might end up with some properties that will be sterilized in their yard. They'll have a house, but their side yards will all be sloping. It's just the nature of the, of the District of North Vancouver. We've had something that's worked in a huge majority. I'm gonna say in the 99th percentile of, of cases, and to suddenly be changing this bylaw based on a couple of cases that have come to the forefront where, neat, where I know the one project is unfinished and there's an old saying, never show a fool a job half done. When, when the trees and everything fill in around that house, everything I think will go back to normal. We raised all these landscapes when they built these houses in the 50s and 60s, there was no trees, there was retaining walls and people hated it then. And now look at it, now they're fighting to defend those. So. Uh, that I've said my piece. I, I hope I hope that uh, 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 Councillor Forbes brought up that, she, that in November that she didn't understand the impact and she wanted to do the research. I think more research needs to be done before we we tar everybody with this brush. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Appreciate. It. Uh, oh, Anybody else wishing to address Council a first? or second time. Dr. Cost, a second time. You have five minutes to address the hearing. Good evening, uh, Your Worship. And as always, when I listen to public uh, hearings, um, there are points uh, brought up um, by other speakers, uh, which I would like to comment or at least ask some questions about. Uh, certainly, um, um, I was a little surprised to hear that if a person wants to uh, repair his uh, wall, um, that uh, you would have to get a permit. Now, I know many walls are made out of just stones, and occasionally the owner has to replace a stone or two and cement it in place. Uh, it would seem ridiculous that in order to do that, minor repairs, uh, that you would have to go to the district uh, and get a permit. This seems uh, kind of nonsensical and akin to saying, well, I'm changing the color of my paint on my house and I need another permit. Um, there has to be some common sense at, at play here. Um, but it also brings up the larger issue. If, uh, what sort of renovation uh, can homeowners do um, to their property without uh, triggering a full compliance to the current bylaws? Um, you know, uh, what I see here is a thin edge or the wedge of yet another bylaw uh, which is non-conforming to a large number of people and, and their susceptibility to uh, making modest renovations to their home, um, far less than uh, the value of the uh, total property, um, and, and yet being forced to, let's say, rebuild their retaining wall as a consequence. 
So I just warned council on unintended consequences of adopting changes like this. Uh, please think carefully about it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cost. Mr. Dwyer, can you speak to sort of a materiality threshold for um, minor maintenance versus a replacement of a retaining wall? Uh, certainly, and I and I kind of had my hand up to I, I want to comment on that. Certainly, we, we we would not require a permit for any kind of minor repair of any retaining wall. Um, if you're completely rebuilding a retaining wall that's let's say eight feet, um, completely rebuilding it, yes, of course you're going to require a permit. But any kind of minor repairs, replacing a, a few stones in a stack rock mortared type of wall, um, there absolutely would be no permit requirement for that. Um, just just an, another comment on you know what limitations are there on um, you know what you can do with a, a non-conforming structure. Um, I mean the, the local government act says that um, the, the structure uh, may be maintained, extended, altered. Um, it can be repaired, extended, altered, um, provided there's no further contravention to the bylaw. So you can basically rebuild. Um, there, there's there's um, there aren't significant limitations uh, for legal non-conforming siting type or height requirements. Thank you, Mr. Dwyer. Okay, uh, do we have any other speakers a first or second time on the matter? Checking in with the clerk, do you have any new speakers from the phone-in system or any new people joining uh, the, the meeting directly? Uh, Your Worship, we have had no additional uh, speakers. Okay. Uh, none of the speakers have been repeating themselves, so we'll offer an opportunity for third time speakers if anybody would like to speak a first, second, or third time. Now would be your opportunity. Mr. Yes, your worship. This is. I see your yes. virtual hand up. Uh, my my virtual speaker. hand is going down. You, yeah, I, you are I learned a new to skill. Test. You're welcome to speak for a third time. I will encourage you to not repeat what you said in your first or second time, please. But uh, you have five minutes to address council. Thank you. I, I don't think I'm repeating myself. Um, you know, uh, I, I say this uh, to you, council. Um, I believe for the most part, uh, you and I are uh, not experts in this field, um, but we have heard from experts and uh, you and I, I think, struggle to understand a lot of the technical details and the experts struggle to explain them to us in a way that, that we can find them understandable. And, and that has been quite difficult in that. So I, I thank Mr. Dwyer, I thank uh, Mr. Baker, um, and also those experts who wrote in and gave feedback. Um, you know, to summarize this council, um, you know, at, at second and third reading, being the subject of a closed public hearing, I don't get to uh, comment. So uh, I'm gonna say to you now, uh, you know, take a look at, at what you're hearing. What you're hearing is um, every single expert that has responded has said, please don't do this. Um, the non-experts have said, please don't do this. Um, the, you know, you set out trying to solve a specific problem with a broad brush. Um, and, and one of the things I want I, I think might put it in perspective, I don't know if any of you watch HGTV and all those home improvement programs, <clears throat> but I find whenever I watch them, I'm astounded with uh, two things. Number one, how quickly they get to work. And number two, how little the renovations or builds cost. Now, I don't know, I'm sure there's a lot of TV uh, drama in that, but do you know the one home improvement program that seems to smack of, of our environment? That's Love It or List It Vancouver, where they end up with real, you know, parts of buildings removed and you know, uh, expensive other things because of inspection processes. We have so much detail in our building code and, and, and do that correlation. How can people build elsewhere for so cheap? And why does it cost so much to build here? And then maybe ask the experts to answer that question. Because I, I don't think you can keep loading on regulation and at the same time expect 
more affordable housing. And, and I know no one's out there trying to make more affordable single family detached houses per se. Per se. Uh, but I can tell you this, um, from what I'm hearing these days, my house that was built 12 years ago would probably be 40% more expensive today and not because of materials and not because of labor. You know, there's just so much regulation and, and I, my house is probably pretty close to what people would want to build today, but um, it is getting so, so expensive. And uh, I, I just really advise caution here. Um, every single voice is telling you, this is not a good move. Um, I suggest this is a time to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steven. Okay, I'll go back. Uh, would anybody else like to speak a first, second, or third time? Okay, Madam Clerk, are there any, or sorry, through to staff, are there any further questions that have been circulated from council through to staff? Mr. Dwyer, any further questions? I think they've all been addressed. If I've if I've missed any of them, uh, if council can point the, them out, but I, I think they've all been addressed. I don't see any members of council jumping up to say something's been specifically missed. Okay, and uh, Madam Clerk, are there any other uh, phone in additional speakers? Uh, Your Worship, there are not. Okay. So then would you agree, Madam Clerk, that we have exhausted speaking opportunities for this public hearing? I would agree, yes. Okay, so we're going to move into the last part of the hearing. I'm going to uh, ask for a member of council to, uh, uh, to make a motion. Move that we close the hearing and return this bylaw to council. Thank you, Councillor Murray. Seconded by Councillor Back, is that correct? Second, Thank yes. You. Thank you, okay. And so uh, I'll call the question on that motion. All those in favor, contrary-minded, motion carries unanimously by council. And so at this time, uh, I'm going to declare that the hearing is closed. And um, what that means is that council cannot receive any additional new information uh, leading up to uh, through second and third reading and actually technically through to adoption. And so what will happen is the, the item, the, there's going to be a little bit of time, uh, a little bit of break. Miss uh, Genevieve Lance, are you able to say when we're likely to see this before council for a second and third reading? Um, depending on the schedule, your worship, this would be returned to uh, an upcoming meeting of council, which would be likely looking into February, the middle of February. Okay. So we'll uh, monitor the, the council agendas coming up, but it'll likely be in the middle of February. We will obviously advertise that in the normal ways as part of the regular council. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for participating. Thank you for staff for facilitating and members of the public for, uh, for sharing your thoughts on the hearing today. Uh, have a great night. Good night, everyone.